Hello and good Hello afternoon, and everybody. Welcome to the seventh episode of Side Talks with Psychologist. I am your host, Ms. Basha, Director at IJAS, Institute of Clinical Process and Related Practice. Today we have with us uh, Alicia Lalji, who is uh, going to talk about psychological issues with special kids. And before we begin, um, if you have any kind of questions, feel free to ask those questions in the comment section and we will surely answer them. And also you can start a watch party on Facebook so that your friends and family can benefit out of this session. Our organization, uh, if I have to give you a brief on it, it, it helps, in, helps in psychologists, uh, coaches, trainers develop uh, advanced coaching and therapeutic skills. Uh, I'd like to, like to talk about our guest, Alicia. Uh, she's a special educator, a counseling psychologist and a psychotherapist. She practices in uh, Bandra uh, in Mumbai and she deals with individuals of uh, this, uh, different disabilities from toddlers to senior citizens. And she also counsels for mental illnesses. Welcome, Alicia. And um, here we get started. So, Alicia, if you can give your uh, brief introduction and then we can move to our topic. Okay. Hello, everyone. This is Alicia here, and it gives me uh, immense pleasure to be a part of this talk today. And there's been a lovely range of series organized for you all, and I'm sure you're going to be kicked about each one of them, today being the seventh one, I guess. So happy watching, keep watching, keep sending in your questions, and I hope you uh, understand the, the particular concept on psychological problems and special needs a lot better after this particular hour is over. Thank you. So uh, since we have the topic right in hand, that what other kind of uh, psychological needs or issues uh, special uh, children uh, have, and when uh, the professionals are helping them, or what is it that they need to keep in mind? Uh, psychological issues are faced by some individuals with disabilities, may not be all. Also, individuals may face one or more of uh, the particular issues. I would want to broadly group them into two categories. So one would be mental illness and the other one would be behavioral problems. So when I talk about mental illness, I mean depression, anxiety, uh, panic uh, disorders, sleep disorders, and probably uh, psychotic features or hallucinations when you probably see or feel things that do not exist. So that would be one category. Uh, the other category would be behavioral problems. Now, this would be seen in either kids, adolescents, or adults. It is also often seen that the kind of behavioral problems experienced by people would also change. So at times, there would probably be anger, uh, aggression, irritability, frustration. You know, as they grow up, you may see screaming. Uh, spitting issues, biting issues, you know, they're biting someone or they are very physically close to somebody, a lot closer uh, than they should be. And they may also develop sexual problems wherein uh, they would probably uh, not uh, understand the rules of sexuality or would masturbate uh, publicly, would touch their genitals publicly in front of other people. They would also go very close to somebody, try to just touch their chest or their private parts, or try to find out how they differ. But considering the IQ that they have, uh, it's going to be very different for each one of them. So somebody who is um, at the higher spectrum or the higher end would be different from somebody at the lower end. So the number of psychological issues are many. Uh, the way in which they manifest would also be many. Uh, and also, it's an age-barred thing. So how it is at 8, it may be very different at 12 and 13. It also depends a lot on the amount of exploration the child is uh, dealing with. And how does one, uh, so how, what kind of uh, awareness the other practitioners should have while uh, you said that there is a, it differs at different age? Uh, so what are the things that we should keep in mind while uh, uh, I feel it's always it's not adult. I feel it's always very important for us to make a log. Uh, so you make a log of the things that you see. You make a log of the things that the parents have told you. You make a log of the things that uh, the other people working with the child have told you. So it's very important to. Ms. Ba is going to be back very soon. 
So let us wait. Hi, Alicia, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Oh, sorry, I got just logged out of the. No, no, not at all. Not I at all. Got... I, not at all. Can Can you hear me clearly? I can. I can. All right. So I'll continue with the question you asked me last. Yes. Yes. So what is it that professionals can do? So I personally believe that each one of us must make a log. Yeah. So this log would comprise of all the issues that I have seen. Now the child may be with me for therapy for a very short time. Yeah. So I would want to know what the parents are seeing. I would also want to know if the child is going to school, what is it that they are seeing? Because the kind of psychological problems that the child probably is witnessing, is facing, and the therapist is witnessing would be very different. Yeah. It may also change according to the location, the situation, the child's moods. Yeah. Make a log of all these. And after making a log of all these, you deal with them in a very systematic way, one at a time. Every issue. Okay. Uh, so, uh, do they actually, what kind of uh, problems do they actually have in, say, for example, I think somebody uh, has asked uh, regarding, let me just uh, check online. Uh, we have somebody who's asked questions. Um, I will just check it and. Uh, sure. Just a moment. Sure. I think the net is working a little. Let me just uh, check online. Uh, we have. Hold on, hold on. Just a moment. Um, so let me first just take the questions that I have right now. And uh, yes. We'll continue with that. I'll have to take a little bit of reference from. 
so we'll just say a quick hi to everybody uh, alisha who's there uh, there's keerthi there is uh, miraz there is dr tesoza uh, is also there and uh, anu jyoti uh, quick hi to everybody okay. and sorry for the inconvenience then it is behaving little weird uh, and thank you for sticking on and waiting <laughs> yes thank you so much for uh, being there and uh, quickly i'll back go back to the questions so alisha a uh, few questions that i have is uh, uh, do special children have a mental capacity to experience uh, depression and anxiety okay now when we talk about special children we need to first know that they have levels of severity at which right. they function okay right. so that would range from mild moderate severe and profound Mm-hmm. so those kids who have um, an iq which is mild mm-hmm. or moderate or would would have impairments that are mild and moderate would definitely mm-hmm. uh, have emotions and anxiety and not only just uh, anxiety and uh, depression they would also face innumerable other uh, emotions as well uh, very mm-hmm. often we have parents that come and say that you know when we are sad our child realizes it yeah you know when we are crying our child realizes it when we are happy or oh, my husband and i have had a fight my child realizes it mm-hmm. okay now this would be with regard to mild and moderate at the same time individuals with disabilities who have severe or profound intellectual functioning would find that a little difficult mm-hmm. so they would not be able to gauge somebody else's emotions they would not know how another person is feeling they would not be able to predict something they would not be able to express their own emotions so mm-hmm. depending on where they are their level of the disability or the level of severity that they have they would either face an emotion or would not face the emotion okay, okay. so in uh, both the scenarios uh, both the kind of scenarios how do we as a practitioner uh, deal with it or uh, work it out when i talked to you about mild and moderate individuals the uh, the mild uh, the people in the mild lot would probably be going to a school and inclusive setup uh and studying with other mainstream school uh, students uh, a moderate a child with a, a moderate intellectual functioning would be in a special school but when we talk about individuals with profound needs they would generally be uh, more often home bound also individuals with impair, uh, severe impairments would either have a residential facility or they would be home they would have speech related issues or mobility related issues Okay. so that is a particular lot which rarely would receive any kind of education okay. the the parents would prefer focusing on basic communication so they can understand what the child is trying to say right. so uh, when we talk about individuals with disabilities and what therapists can do it's mainly the mild and the moderate uh, category that we deal with most often uh, the severe category very rarely and the profound category i would say we don't deal with the profound category at all okay. academically academically uh, in general uh, if we had to work with all the four categories uh, what kind of result do we expect mm-hmm. like uh, from a mild one to go to uh, you know become more you know uh, improvement wise i'm asking what would be uh, the progress Firstly, that we when we talk about the four categories the four categories can never be under the same roof right okay. so individually right. when you're working right. with the so uh, when there is someone with uh, a mild disability i would suggest that if there are behavioral concerns which are very severe we medicate them make them calm down and then let them be in an inclusive setup at the same time while they are in an inclusive setup or mainstream schooling you let your other therapies happen at the same time so that would be ot speech remediation and other things okay. individuals okay. who are on uh, the the moderate category i mean i don't like saying the the word category but i say it so that you can understand it better yeah, it so don't be wrong there right. we would not so want when, to make it otherwise yes definitely so when i talk about moderate i mean that such individuals may finish their basic education but with a more specialized uh, coaching method so maybe something like an nio schooling would benefit them or uh, something like uh, you know when they choose subjects which are related to baking or cooking or uh, uh, things which they like and what we generally focus on is we help them develop a skill okay or a particular uh, talent 
mm-hmm. or a particular hobby that they would enjoy doing at the same time when they grow up it would fetch them some kind of money so right. if i for example at present i'm working with somebody who is uh, 31 years old so she is very uh, creative Mm-hmm. so what she is doing is she makes uh, she decorates envelopes she uh, decorates bags and does other things like that so how would we start training her so maybe when she was younger we started showing her how they looked we started teaching her simple folding we started mm-hmm. teaching her how to apply fevicol uh, we started teaching her okay these are diff- different keys or sequences this is the color and this is how you put it this is a flower you have like a sample in front of you and then you ask the child or the adult to copy it so when we start very like, gradually like this step wise at the end of it after a few years it will take time but uh, then the, the the person is doing something and they also feel that worthy of what they are doing and they also feel empowered to a very great extent because they are doing something you're selling it you're getting money out of it though the money is not important it's just being empowered at the end of it so that's how we would help the moderate category when it comes to the, the people in the severe category now these individuals generally would be probably non verbal uh, they would have uh, severe aggression hyperactivity uh, so my first the first thing i tell parents is you get them to communicate so you use different apps or you use a communication key teach them basic activities of daily living like i tell a lot of parents that you're going to be a lot happier if your child learns to brush their teeth on their own in comparison to the child probably writing a word that you're teaching him or her from the past one year mm-hmm. so you focus on activities of daily living brushing bathing uh, you know independent eating wearing your own clothes you focus on that first primarily and when it comes to the individuals with severe uh, mental functioning i'm sorry the first one i just said was severe now i'm moving on to profound okay okay so, no problem so now when you move on to individuals with the profound category these are individuals who need help 24/7 uh, they are individuals that face the maximum amount of difficulties so toilet training is probably not possible they are bedridden they are still in their diapers uh, even basic indication of things food hunger is not there so they, it takes a lot of time we teach only one or two basic things but uh, it's very difficult i wouldn't say it's completely impossible but in most of the cases it is impossible okay when you say uh, when you do first question is do you uh, as a professional work with such uh, uh, children or adults who are at a severe stage see we do but uh, very honestly therapy doesn't last for very long because uh, every parent uh, putting in efforts realizes that my child is not learning too much so they all try but at the end of it the child has his or her limitations the parents don't see results now even if we join a course and we don't see results we are going to leave so these are parents yeah. who've tried for many many years and tried different different professionals so what i tell them is this is the way it's to be done mm-hmm. so you take two sessions and then you start training because ultimately you are the basic caregiver you are the one that the child has to identify you are the one that will end up doing everything so i would just take like a session or two to train parents because that's going to work wonders in comparison to working with the child also we need to understand that this particular child who is profound with regard to his or her internet intellectual capacity would may not recognize me may not want to learn with me so i rather teach the parents and tell them that this is the method that i probably feel that you should be following yeah that that sounds very uh, feasible and uh... uh right. something which will go a long way right lovely um alicia let us just just check if somebody has asked us any kind of uh, questions so yes um uh somebody has asked that uh, in this lockdown how does one manage a special teenage child now i don't think they've given more detail on that but if you could just uh, uh, as a practitioner um... okay okay let us answer this question in two parts how do you manage a child and how do you manage a teenager theek hai so it will cater to yeah. a lot of other uh, special child 
Yeah. Yes, certainly. Okay. So when it comes to managing a special child during the lockdown, okay, we all understand it's a big task and it's difficult. Because firstly, most individuals want to go out, so they miss going out of the house like you and I do. So that is the 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 first concern. How do you manage it? I tell parents that you need to start dividing your roles. So it's not one parent who is generally the mother who is doing everything. So you divide your job. If you have grown up siblings, you ask them also to take over. So when you divide it into four different parts, every person knows when it is you know their time of the day to take care of this child. So the others can take it easy then. That's the first thing. Give the child a little structure. So when I say give the child a little structure, it's been two months and we're not on a holiday. Okay. Absolutely. Also, if we take it like a holiday, and when the child goes to school, maybe a regular school or a special school, the the transition bit is going to be a big big task. Right. Because then we'll have to start from a scratch. Hmm. So you try and make a small timetable for the child to follow. Mm-hmm. So probably, okay, you want to wake up late, you can wake up an hour or two later than you usually do. But you have to bathe. A lot of parents have told me that the kids don't want to bathe, saying that school to not go. Why should we have a bath? Some right. parents have also said that our kids don't communicate. Earlier they would come home and tell us this is what happened in school and this is what the teacher said. Now they don't feel it's necessary to communicate. So you have like a small mini school system in your house, mm-hmm. where you may not take three subjects or three activities a day, but make them do a little bit of writing, even if it's ten minutes a day, a little bit of reading, even uh, train them to use a new app. We are going to do wonders if you train them in a manner of that sort. Right. Uh, train them to eat on their own. So are in the house. A lot of parents have said that पहले एक घंटे में खाता था अब तीन घंटे तक प्लेट सामने ही रहती है. So I tell them that आप भले ही टिफिन बॉक्स में डाल दीजिए the food. Let the child think I'm in school. Ring a bell, find a tune, an audio tune for it. Ring a bell, say now this is your eating time. Ring a bell again, now this is your stopping time. See, yeah. we train like this. Okay, our child with special needs will not pick up seeing others. We have to train them many many times before they've learned. So yeah. you try and have a school system. Now uh, another thing is the writing posture. So I tell parents only because school is not on, we don't make them sit on the floor. Hmm. If you don't have a table, you keep two pillows. You know, let the child sit on the floor if you know that's the only way out. But we have to train in a particular manner, wherein we don't see the child regress when the child goes back to school. Yes. Okay. So you work on a, a little bit of ac- ac- academics. Also, another thing that I've seen is individuals get very socially isolated. people with special needs the reason being they are not having webinars they are not having zoom classes so once in a way have a video call with the therapist or with the other friends mm-hmm. they may not understand what has happened but they know they are home bound right so what you can do is uh, you know tell them that you are going to be going to school again you are going to meet your friends again so let them understand that there is going to be normalcy very soon mm mm-hmm. Uh, they can also be a lot of uh, games now with regard to adults they can be a lot of or adolescents games that you structure in the house so mm-hmm. you can play musical chairs you can sit and discuss the moon one day you can sit and you know plant a tree one day and show them that this is how a seed grows into a plant you can discuss different fruits with them or you know there are a lot of things that we can work on depending on the age of the child the understanding of the child but i feel one constructive activity is very important uh, you know a little bit of writing or academics is also very important so you can teach them uh, a new skill with regard to something that they like you know so a lot of kids are now into graphics and learning graphics on their own on the computer mm-hmm. install some new apps to make them do that so there are a lot of things that we can do like that lovely uh, i'm sure uh, this uh, question uh, zina had asked i think that's been answered really uh, well or uh, Uh, we have another question uh, alisha which is uh, if a child is not able to learn his study materials uh, including basic spellings easily but uh, remembers other things without any difficulty uh, is is showing symptoms of learning is he showing the symptoms of learning disability it's not necessary 
Okay. See, uh, also yeah. when we identify somebody or we try to label somebody with learning disability, we can do it with 95% accuracy only after the child has crossed five years of age. Right. If the child is not learning spellings or not learning an answer, uh, it's there's a high possibility that the child just doesn't want to do it. Now, mm. how many of us or how many people hearing me here were inclined towards their books or studies? I wasn't. Nor was so, I. No, yeah, so many aren't, but that doesn't mean they're not going to end up doing anything in life. Absolutely. We need to understand what part of studies do they not like. For example, if a child doesn't like spellings, you sing out the spellings, record it in an audio message, and then allow the child to hear, hear your voice or his voice. It's really going to help. There's an answer that the child can't memorize. Sing it out, you know, or make animal mm -hmm. sounds and learn it. The more interesting you make it, the child is going to learn. Always I, remember. I, yes, sorry. No, no. I was just going to add to it that you need to get up and get your creative side up. Correct. See, learning disability according to statistics just for you to know is one in five which means that every uh, two people in ten it's one in five so every in every five people there's one person with ld so i'm not going to be out labeling them all okay you don't like studies that's your lookout but basic education has to be complete so how you complete that is the challenge. So you make it as interesting as possible. If the child is in a higher class, find interesting videos. In fact, I was just doing a Zoom session an hour ago, teaching a child on the spectrum, the different internal organs. So what we did is uh, we saw there were worksheets from the school. I can't be sitting with worksheets from here. So I told him, I showed him a video. I showed him how it looked. Then I told him, now you stand and I stand and let us, you show me where your heart is. You show me where your brain is. So we did a kind of an exercise like that. And that's how they're going to pick up even on Zoom calls. Not that Zoom calls work for all, but a lot of practical demonstration is it as interesting as possible. So the learner is going to have fun. Hmm. Right. Sounds perfect. Uh, there's somebody who's asked that, how, do, uh, how does one uh, manage your uh, ADAD? ADHD kids are at in this lockdown. Okay, now that is a challenge. Now, when it comes to individuals with ADHD who are so prone to, you know, being, please excuse my language, but being all over the place, it is going to be a task. Now, what you need to do is you need to channelize this energy into something else. Okay, so it's okay to punch a pillow if you're allowed to use the terrace of your building or the the area in the building, uh, the compound, allow them to run, allow them to jump, hop, skip, get them tired. That's like the first tip for parents. Okay. If it is very, very severe, I would suggest that you consult help, visit a psychologist and consider taking medications. Now, okay. I would like to give you a small brief about medications since a lot of parents may not be in favor of the same. So how mm -hmm. is it that medications work? We all have chemicals in the brain. So on a particular day, you feel a little lethargic, you feel very driven or you feel uh, very happy or very sad. Now, these chemicals are supposed to be in a certain proportion. When they are not in a certain proportion, we act in a certain manner. Giving medication for ADHD in this matter would level that, would level this particular proportion. And then the child would calm down. And later hmm. on, you know, the doctor seeing the child would start weaning off medication. Okay. So this is something that I would tell parents that if the child is very, very hyper, please consult a psychiatrist for medication. It would really help you because uh, sometimes for all this, the problems or all the issues that we face, therapy may not help. But therapy, counseling, along with medication, all in tandem would give you amazing results for sure. Right. Uh, I think, Alicia, we have a lot of questions that have come. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to ask you the next question, which is um, how to teach a special child uh, basic needs uh, like uh, brushing, bathing, and when the child gets cranky, he just hits himself and he's in a way addicted to phone and iPad. So in any way, one can teach him. Okay. Firstly, when a child gets angry, do not talk to the child. You talk to the child or you modify behavior only when the child is in a good mood. 
Okay, so if I have to give a child a list of rules, I give it when the child is more calm to listen to me. If there is self-injury, there is no way out but medication because the child needs to be calm. So if you see that the child is harming themselves, the first thing you have to do is restrain. Hold the child and stop the child because we can't have the child injure himself or herself. So the first thing is you restrain the child. The second thing is you definitely have to consult a doctor for medication because if there is self-injury uh, either during adolescence, it's going to increase with time. It's not going to stop. How do you teach a child basics? We generally have something that you can make in the house, which is called a communication key or a communication board, wherein you teach the child, for example, if this is brushing that you have to do, these are the 10 steps. So the first would be probably identifying your own toothbrush. Mm -hmm. The second would be picking up the paste, opening it, applying paste on the brush, holding your brush. So, you know, we may take it very lightly, but even holding your toothbrush is a very big step and a very big milestone. Then bringing that toothbrush close to your mouth. That is another step that you follow. So we teach in a very slow manner. There is something called backward chaining, which means I don't go from the first step to the 10th step. I go from 10 to 1. Mm -hmm. So if you feel that, you know, my child knows how to brush a little, TK, you work on strengthening that. That would be the last step. Then you, or probably the second last step, then you get the child to gargle and rinse his or her mouth. So you start off from the step that you feel the child will learn. Because otherwise, if you go to go to see it in a very sequential manner, there are many, many steps that follow. So I feel for anything that you want to make the child learn, even uh, I'll give you another example of activities of daily living. A simple thing which we consider simple, which is wearing your shoes. Hmm. Parents often get very annoyed with the laces. I tell them, don't give them laces at all. Velcros are absolutely fine. The most important thing to teach somebody wearing their shoes is actually learning left and right. Yeah. So what do you do for this? You take a colored ribbon, tie it on the right shoe or stick a particular piece of that red ribbon on the right shoe and I tie the same one on my right hand. Yeah. So I'm teaching this child matching red to red. So once one shoe is worn, I know where the other one goes in the other foot. But you don't at the same time put the ribbon on both the both the shoes. You just yeah. do it on one. How do you teach left and right? You teach only one. One. So if I say this is right, and I point to the other one and say this is not right. I don't introduce left. Yeah. So this is how activities of daily living are taught. There, there is a long sequence that follows, keeping in mind the needs of the child. Uh, Sakya Sikhana is also very important. What is important? So that's how it goes. I hope I've answered your question. Uh, yeah, I'm sure uh, it's really a well-explained answer. Um, I want to ask, uh, can special children experience uh, emotions and uh, they can express the same? They do. Okay. We'll be surprised and, uh, you know, we may feel that they don't, but they do. Uh, how do they express it? They may not uh, be able to express it very well. So you may see, you know, that they start flapping their hands if they're very happy or they put their hands on top, you know, if they're very, very excited. They may even drool if they're very happy. They may uh, come very physically uh, close to you. They may try to kiss you. They may try to pull you. Uh, they may even be uh, foot tapping. A lot of tapping is seen on the spectrum. Uh, they may even try to lick you or hold you. They may not know how to express it in a right manner, but they definitely experience a wide range of emotions. Right. Okay. I have another question. Um, so uh, if an autistic adult is hesitant to do activities, and throws uh, tantrums, then uh, what can be a positive reinforcement? Uh, See, would the positive person... reinforcement uh, be uh, beneficial? See, firstly, uh, if the person is an adult, stickers and smileys on the hand may not work. Okay, that works for kids. So you have to find out what is it that the adult likes. If the, the adult likes TV time or the adult likes good food, so you use that as a reinforcement. You always use something as a reinforcer that the adult likes. Mm. Also, you can give something which would be a negative reinforcer. So, you know, you've not done it, so you don't get it. Mm. 
we also call that a punishment punishment here means that you like to eat meetha today you've not really done your job so no meetha after lunch or dinner so that could be a punishment always remember with adults searching for reinforcers may be a task but reinforcers are given based on what the individual likes so find out what the person likes and it will definitely work it would work for me as well i mean it would work for yeah. any of us Or, yeah, it will work for But any what of us. What you may like, like would be very different from what I like. So you know, find out what is it that the person likes. Absolutely. Uh, there is an autistic uh, teenager child who is very aggressive and wants to go out and wa- wants to see TV, adult shows, and fighting videos. How can uh, we help the parent and the child both? So, as a psychologist, how would you? uh work with uh, or a special educator how would you work with uh, such children uh, such okay. teenager I, autistic I would answer the first bit first if there is a child with special needs who really feels the need to step out of the house uh, i uh, there is somebody who has got this done so you go to your local doctor take a letter saying that this particular child is special and he or she needs to be out of the house go to the police station submit it and you do get permission i know of somebody who has done it so you do get permission you can take the child out so that would solve your problem to an extent because okay. the child is allowed to step out so you need to take a letter from the doctor and submit it at the police station they are going to give you a clearance for an hour or whatever and obviously the child would be well protected with a mask and gloves and whatever is required uh, the second uh, part of your question is watching something adult uh, now remember that watching something adult is done by all individuals who have crossed a particular age so pornographic viewing is very common in the so called normal or neurotypical population it is also common not so common though in individuals with special needs individuals mm-hmm. with special needs experience this a similar kind of emotions as a so called uh, neurotypic or normal as the people call it emotions so when it comes to getting erections or when it comes to getting their period when it comes to getting aroused or feeling different sexual urges that's all in time or maybe a delay which should be a little bit depending on the severity of the child so watching that would be okay at the same time watching too much of it is not okay because then it's going to become an addiction and there's no medication for any addiction so we need to understand that this particular adult watching pornographic material is normal but you need to restrain it to an extent with regard to the timing mm-hmm. so that's the first thing watching aggressive things and becoming aggressive you need mm-hmm. to stop the child from then watching it you can tell him or her that if you're going to get aggressive and try and copy such things then you don't get any screen time i would also like to add one thing with regard to the adult watching pornographic content that uh, limit that to a particular duration uh, also let the parents see what is the type that they are watching which is very important right. let the, the adult have a certain private space which they would want which is mm. absolutely fine even if you see your child with special needs fondle or touch themselves parents it's normal rest assured you need to tell them where you're doing it is what needs to be considered what you're doing it is not wrong so you either tell them that you know you want to touch yourself i step out of your room or um, if you're touching yourself publicly you tell them that i suggest you go to the washroom so don't tell them don't do this ye galat hai nahi karna hai because that's just going to add more anger and frustration in them tell them kahan karna hai you know that's going to be more important makes sense completely uh i think one this one more questions that what would be the right age to send a child for a assessment for learning disability when the school pushes you don't right. do it otherwise why do you want to do it some just sail through see ld has always been there earlier mm-hmm. in a, a class uh, strength probably like you know typical ssc schools have 50 60 students a yes. standard mein they would be like 250 kids mm-hmm. Two, three, five would get detected. No. The reason why people keep talking about it now is because awareness, sadly, here is doing no good to us. Hmm. If your school, if you're in an, if your child, for example, is an IB school and is not able to cope up, and the school tells you to do it, please do it. 
if you hmm. feel shifting your child to an easier board would be good please do it only out of your own curiosity some parents also like to you know make sure everything is fine hmm. so i have a niece who scores 9 on 10 my sister wanted to know why she didn't score 10 on 10 so she told me should i get her tested so there are parents who are anxious there are parents who are hyper leave it even a 5 on 10 is fine it's not the end of the world do not go in for testing just to see that your child is fine go in for testing if the school tells you to do it there is no compulsion otherwise let them sail through and do whatever they want to do later in life if you feel the board is not apt considering the academic level of the child please go ahead and change it you know you can shift to an easier board we have like i don't know how many boards now so shift lot many But are there in what do we it. have lot many don't just do it otherwise it's not required and what are you going to do with that label where are you going to stick it what you, what advantage are you going to get out of it very important so oh, very true and there's always sure a lot of attached to labels so always remember do not label unless you really need to label absolutely i completely second those thoughts uh, there's one more question from dimpul and she says that uh, uh, how can one uh, how can a child express his or her feelings or his pain uh he's already 8 years old and uh, he's not able to speak as in okay, uh, now he's not get speech yet not got speech right okay uh, dimple so the answer for you here is individuals with special needs at times have very high pain thresholds when i say that uh, i mean that they may actually hurt their hand really hard and i have seen them hurt their hand really hard but they may not even say an ow or an ouch mm. okay so that's called having a very high pain threshold so what you do is if you see that happen hold the child's hand press it a little you know and say see you've got hurt so this is supposed to be ow this hurts you okay another thing you can do is hold the child's hand gently then press it very slowly make the child realize that okay now it's a little discomfort comfortable you're holding it a little hard and tell them this is pain you don't have to slap and hit the child to make them realize what pain is when we teach in therapy you hold a little hard put a little pressure and say see this is pain this is hurting you and then you see the child's facial expressions change and you say you know see this is pain so we teach emotions like that there are also apps to teach uh, emotions there's something called uh, social skill builder wherein they have like a happy song they sing a happy song to you they give you one or two examples and says okay this person is happy and this makes me happy and the same goes for sadness so it has to be very modified in a very situation specific manner like you know this is when you feel happy this is when you feel sad okay i'm giving you jalebis you're feeling happy see you're smiling this is called happy yeah this is how it goes okay um bhakti has a question um inclusion in normal school is not possible for a severe um children correct uh, yeah she i don't know what she's uh, wanting to ask but i think is there any light you want to throw on that <laughs> okay bhakti so the answer for you here is inclusion for severe children is not possible firstly our poor kid uh, you know uh, our kid who has a severe disability will not understand anything that's happening hmm. so making them sit there is not going to make sense i know there are a lot of rules that you know make them sit on the front bench or uh, you know give them one on one attention but even in a class strength of 20 which is the normal they're not going to be able to understand what is happening they are going to be lost also they may have certain uh, behaviors which would disturb the others in the class so the parents of the other kids may not also be very comfortable so why keep the child in a particular place where he or she is not able to understand anything that's happening we rather keep the child somewhere where he can understand what's happening yeah? yes yeah. absolutely um so there are such questions uh, that i have it from my end would be um for psychologist who uh, wish to start practicing with special kids uh what are the key things that you would like to tell them i think firstly it's very important for you to know about all the disabilities your theory right. needs to be strong so if you are in any psychology field medical field or special education you can't say ye maine option mein chhod diya you have to know everything right. 
Okay. You can't say that I left out uh, substance abuse in my exam. I didn't want to do it. You're going to get. I mean, that's just an example. But you're going to get uh, individuals from all disabilities. So it's very important for you to first know the theory. I also feel that you know, if you could do a small diploma somewhere, it would really help. Because, like they say, if you've seen one person on the spectrum, you've seen just one person on the spectrum. So till date, if I've seen thousand, there will be no two who have been similar. Forget being the same. Mm -hmm. So for you to understand early signs or how it goes, I would suggest you do a diploma. Suggest you learn about uh, all the disabilities on your own. You can read up from somewhere. I also feel if you can get connected with certain groups of individuals who are already in the field who can guide you a little. It's very important. See, we all need a guide. We all need a mentor. Yeah. So my mentor, Dr. Avinash Disuza, is watching me right now, and I feel very happy about it. But we all have queries that we need to catch some default. So if I am stuck, if I don't know what to do, he's the first person I would call and say, "Kya karna hai?" I'm stuck. So at the same time, you need to have a mentor so that you know you're not messing up, which is very, very Absolutely. important. Very important, I suggest. Yes. Um. Thank you, um, Arisha, on that. There is one more question that I have. That uh, can you share some case studies uh, on which you've worked with special kids with respect to their uh, challenges and what are the techniques or uh, approach that you have followed where do i start from <laughs> okay let me tell you something very fascinating that uh, is i think around 4 5 months old from now so i once saw a robo in a, a shop and uh, robos <laughs> are said to work very well with individuals with disabilities or individuals on the spectrum so i picked up that small little robo it's called silver lit it's a little bigger than my palm and mm -hmm. uh, i said okay we've read it uh, read about it in theory let me see if this actually works so i tested that robo or you know i used it and showed it to different people who i knew and then i actually used it with five kids with disabilities and i mm -hmm. realized that i had somebody who would not smile who you know was socially reserved but seeing the twerking tweaking noise that the robo made she would smile i had somebody else who didn't like personal contact but my robo would move around everywhere so mm. i thought he would get frightened but he actually went to touch it and hold it so your grip gets developed i had somebody who didn't say their own name so this robo could record up to 3 4 words so i mm -hmm. kept saying that name so my robo kept running around saying the name she picked up her own name so mm -hmm. this is something which is a little different which is not paper pencil uh, in origin because see, we generally talk about papers and pencils and books but this is something different right. and it worked wonders and now i feel i'm going after the lockdown i'm going to buy another one which is 2 feet tall and um, there are also robos that uh, get very upset when you leave them alone you know there are these uh, attention seeking robos so when we want a no. child on the spectrum to actually talk and get social if you don't talk to him he's going to throw a temper tantrum so the child mm -hmm. is supposed to talk and maintain a communication you know a conversation so this is one uh, not very new it's around 3 4 months old but a thing that uh, i felt was very interesting and you just learn on the job remember that <laughs> right uh for the uh, practitioners would you want to share some other things uh, that somebody who's newly getting into field you already said that uh, they can do some kind of diploma now we are suggesting this diploma um, after once they've done their masters and uh, then they have chosen the specialization and then this diploma comes any uh, kind of uh, you can throw some light on it kya kaun sa diploma karna chahiye ya kya cheez one should look forward to Okay now with regard to diplomas let me tell you that I personally uh, I'm not running any diploma at present but if there's somebody who's really interested you know you can forward my phone number to them I am also there on Facebook and Google so you can get in touch with me and whatever is happening then I will send you a link with regard to education you know you can keep studying so i would suggest a diploma even for a child of even for a parent of a child with a special need it's even done by senior citizens or grandparents to understand their uh, nieces and nephews better so you can do it after your 12th you can do it after your graduation you can do it whenever you want to understand individuals with special needs so there is mm -hmm. no age bar yes there are certain diplomas that require you to be a graduate so you can figure that out now there are a few uh, courses which are running online uh, 
so you can see what is that that is running online but at the same time they just come and go and there are different people doing it so you can keep learning till you don't find a place where you can do it you can definitely uh, you know do some reading on uh, authentic websites or youtube channels you can learn a lot from that in fact youtube has some amazing uh, ways in which uh, physio uh, in which aqua therapy is done you know uh, therapy in the water or yes. how do you calm a child who has uh, you know who is hyper they may or may not be of indian origin but it's great to learn i mean even nowadays here and there i would scroll through one or two of them you never know what you'll learn you know but right. you you have to always keep that horizon open so right. you can look Absolutely. up some videos i think learning would be is a lifetime process uh one more question to go uh, what are the various kind of uh, aggression uh, in special children aggression uh, see it depends now earlier if i'm for example 5 years old i would be aggressive if you are not giving me a toy when i'm mm. 10 i would be aggressive if you are not giving me the food you like i may get aggressive when i grow up when i peak adolescence and i see other people having boyfriends and girlfriends so mm. i may not be able to communicate it to you but i definitely understand that you know uh, this is something that uh, other people are doing and i can't do if i reach 15 and i realize people have a social circle and i don't have one i'm going to get upset or aggressive or irritated when i cross 20 i realize people are getting married and having babies i don't know where the babies come from but the fact that there are three and i'm just one alone with mummy and daddy i'm going to get aggressive on that again so the term or the concept of aggression is going to change it's never going to be uh, the same what makes me aggressive today may not make me aggressive after a year also adolescence is a phase of aggression for everybody because we have hormonal change you know you're at the peak of puberty so each one of us has also normally got irritable but for them it would be uh, magnified to greater levels considering their challenges uh, then some would also get aggressive if they are unable to communicate so you know somebody a caregiver not understanding what i'm trying to say or probably if i'm feeling discomfort i have soiled my clothes or if i'm bedridden and i have a bed sore that's hurting me a lot that would make me uh, very hyper excited or very irritable individuals with seizures are generally more hyper excited so they would get uh, more irritable more anger because it's mm-hmm. ultimately the brain which is hyper excited so what we see is hyper activity right Uh, there's somebody um, who's asked uh, how to correct a confusion of B and D yeah, in a child. Can can that person elaborate that for me, please? B and D. So I think the child is confused between the letter B and D. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Uh, so uh, there are many theories for this. Uh, one very nice one which I had read. I will just tell you. Uh, see for b and d there have been many that i have learned so far there's a very nice one that i had learned recently i think it said uh, this is the belly and this is the bump uh, another one said that you know you make the child sit in a particular position and say that this is the door and this is not the door uh, so there are many many different kinds of things okay okay um yeah. uh there's one more question and i think this is going to be your last question as well uh coming to almost an end of the session but the se- uh, question being that uh, who's been your inspiration the man watching me has been my inspiration <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, okay and... that's a very sweet uh, question i uh... i have been studying on the job so uh, when i finished my uh... education i kept uh, you know i finished my psychology then i did b ed then i did m ed i feel you keep studying and i am still studying i am doing my phd at uh, present and uh, we all have role models and sometimes they change over time sometimes we are able to you know uh, be close to them sometimes your role models even change because your career plans uh, uh, change but it's always important to have a mentor it's always important to have a role model not to emulate them but then you kind of know for yourself what you want to do right uh, so what kind of advice or tips that you would give to psychology students and 
to go ahead with their uh, the field that they have chosen as a what, what psychology is a subject uh, it you know people generally feel that because it's done through arts it has no importance but that's very sad let me clear this myth for you abroad in a lot of universities to do psychology you need science so what you're doing is uh, is not just an arts program remember that very well uh, also to do psychology you need to have a masters first there are many different specializations that you have there's even something called sports psychology forensic psychology that is there keep studying keep learning the field is not new but it keeps having new advances absolutely so um, uh, keep learning keep reading uh, you need to also probably subscribe to a few pages like you know we have the the ips like we have the indian psychiatric society we have an indian psychology society read up what are, what is new read up the rules that are coming uh, read up what is different you know there are new new things that keep coming all the time so if you subscribe to certain uh, places that would uh, really help i would want to go back to the b and d i'm not able to recollect exactly but uh, if you make the child sit near the door now i'm talking about uh, the d the bump would go to the door and you keep another bell on this side and you put a placard for b near the bell so you say the bell is here and the d is here so i know when i put the bump during your case it becomes a lot easier <laughs> the bell in yeah. the door yes i i i'm i'm like quite excited that you did get back to what you wanted to find out and you did tell them the answer no actually Great. this is not what it was it was something else but you know what we all form hundreds of strategies for different kids yes so it's so, it's it's so different spontaneous. it's very yes. spontaneous and uh, quite creative you know we can make uh, so many activities just out of a blank sheet of paper <laughs> True. There's so much you can do. So, uh, somebody asked the question that uh, would Udemy courses would be advisable as a practitioner if you're going. Um, as a practitioner, firstly, I would tell you when you start off, uh, you are going, to, or a student. See, when you start off, firstly, my personal advice is, when we are students, we think, okay, I'm going to finish ME and start my own clinic. Do not do that. the reason being is you need to see a lot of people i have worked full time for 3 years in a beautiful school i have worked in a multidisciplinary team of an acco therapist ot pt speech physio everything happening under the same roof visual therapy you pick up after that dheere dheere you try and branch out of freelance if you think post ma at 22 and 23 you're going to start your own clinic my dear friend it sounds lovely but it doesn't work out work under somebody trained work under somebody experienced so that's the first thing you need to do get that kind of experience keep studying and keep upgrading yourself and then slowly branch out right Yes, I am sure everybody's uh, questions uh, have been answered very beautifully and uh, very well explained by Alisha. Um, so we are almost at the end of the session. Uh, Alisha, thank you so much for your uh, valuable input and your time, and thank you all the viewers. Um, we have come yet to another uh, episode of Psych Talks with Psychologists, and I hope you had a resourceful session. a small reminder for uh, today's i had told you yesterday that basically the uh, web series that we are having at the end of the day at 10 o'clock which is um, you know two talks with therapists is over yesterday but we still have a last for sure a question and answer session uh, that has been along extended because there were a lot of questions yesterday in the last night series and they are also going to cover flip model they're going to cover uh, hypnodrama they're going to cover cord cutting in that session so do tune in uh, with um, true talks uh, for therapist with uh, nitin shah and uh, mamta sharma at 10 uh, pm today um, on fp uh, yeah so i'm going to see you all tomorrow again at 4 o'clock and tomorrow we have the topic is going to be rbt